Hello and welcome to Beauty in the Biz, where we talk about the business and marketing side of plastic surgery. I'm your host, Catherine Maley, author of Your Aesthetic Practice, What Your Patients Are Saying, as well as consultant to plastic surgeons to get them more patients and more profits. So today's special guest is Dr. Steven Weber. He's a facial and reconstructive facial plastic surgeon in private practice in Denver, Colorado for the past 15 years. Now he focuses on cosmetic facial surgery, laser skin resurfacing, as well as injectables. Now, Dr. Weber was a medical student at Boston University School of Medicine, then completed a five-year Oton Larnagology and had neck surgery residency at Oregon Health and Science University, then a fellowship at the University of Michigan. Now, he's lectured throughout the country and abroad regarding the latest surgical and non-surgical procedures. He's authored over 50 publications and in peer-reviewed academic journals and textbooks and continues to teach and train other providers on injectables and lasers. Now, Dr. Weber also gives back to his community by donating to local schools and law enforcement agencies, as well as by volunteering with Face to Face. That's a nonprofit project by the AAF PRS and he takes part in mission trips to East Africa and Latin America, performing clip, clip lift and palate repairs, as well as burn scar treatments for medically isolated children and adults. Now, his most recent humanitarian mission was with Outreach International to provide medical and surgical care. Welcome, Dr. Weber, to Beauty and the Biz. It is a pleasure to finally get you on here. Thanks, Catherine. It's such an honor to be, uh, be on your podcast. I, I've listened to this podcast religiously. So it's it's a real pleasure to be here tonight. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. So how did you end up in Denver? Because it doesn't sound like you're from Denver. It sounds like you were more on the West Coast and a little Oregon and Michigan. Where, where How'd you get there? Yeah, I, I grew up in California. I went to college at UC Davis in Northern California. And then for medical school and everything in between, I was in uh, you know Boston, Portland, spent some time in Seattle, did my fellowship at Michigan. And then uh, went back and worked in Portland, Oregon at Oregon Health and Science University for a couple of years in academics. And then I actually, you know, decided that with facial plastic surgery, academics was just a really tough uh, fit for what I wanted to do with aesthetics. And so I actually moved to a, a small bedroom community in Colorado named Lone Tree. It's a city of about 18,000 people. Um, because I took a job in private practice as an employee here in Lone Tree, and I did that for about two years. I was employed, and then um, I've lived and worked in Lone Tree since 2011. So when I when I left that job in 2013, um, I opened up my own practice here in the same city, and uh, have have lived and worked in this little bedroom community for over a decade. Any issues with you? Open shop right next door? <laughs> no, I, I did not have any sort of a non-compete agreement. You know, my, you know, business business breakups are always difficult, but that was one issue that, that did not come up because uh, I uh, thankfully did not have a non-compete. Um, I did have one at the university in Portland, and it was essentially leave the state, you know, move to Washington, move to Idaho maybe Hawaii versus California. But um, yeah, thankfully that wasn't an issue when I arrived here because I just, I fell in love with this community and uh, being so close to the mountains and being in Colorado has just been um, wonderful for me and my family. Oh, I can imagine. Um, I, I think half of California has moved to Colorado <laughs> since COVID. So what's the, um, what's the population now? I'm sure it's crazy. Yeah, D Denver in particular is just booming. And essentially from Fort Collins in the north all the way down to the New Mexico border, that that whole corridor is just exploding. So even though we're about 25 minutes outside of Denver, uh, this area has just been um, wonderful for us and for our business because we draw patients from all along that I-25 corridor and from, you know, from Denver and from outside the state. Um, by the way, your building, do you own or lease? Yeah, so we own two condos in our building. It's a sort of mixed use, you know, medical, uh, financial um, building. So we bought two condos there in 2018. And we moved our office where we were leasing 
into that new space. So in terms of a long-term plan, it, it's always been really important for me to own the real estate. I think in terms of a transition to retirement at some point, I think that's a big part of my planning. The reason I asked, you said you were close to that 125. Um, did you, are you close enough where you have drive-by? Can they see you? And were you able to put up really good outside signage so people know you're there? Yeah, we have great outside signage that, you know, both of the, the buildings that we've been in, we we're able to do that. Uh, but unfortunately, it's not visible from I-25, but uh, most people fly through this area at 95 miles an hour. So I'm not sure many people would see it, but we have good um, uh, street-facing signage that's really visible from the street. And we are right near Park Meadows Mall, which is one of the busiest malls in, in the country. And so we do have a lot of traffic uh, driving by and seeing our building and seeing our signage. So that's been really good for practice building. Just out of curiosity, um, quite a few surgeons, um, when they're near a mall, they ha they can't help themselves but buy those billboards or the rotating uh, signage in the mall. Have you ever done that? And if so, has it helped? Um, I think we might have done that briefly about 10 years ago. And, uh, you know, we, we get pitched to buy the little... Um, advertisements on the shopping carts, you know, when people are at Safeway shopping. Uh, I have, for the most part, resisted those things. I think it's probably decent for branding, but I think for marketing, I, I can't imagine there's a very big return on investment. But um, we might have done that a decade ago, but I, I, we haven't done any recent marketing at the mall. I would say, you know, it's not the first place I would go. The funny thing is, is I, as a marketing and business consultant, I notice those signs more. Like I've seen your you. signs more than anybody else has probably because they're, because I'm so into it. But when you're out shopping randomly and you, it's just, you're not in the context of thinking that way. So for you to like, for that to register, it's just, a it's not the first place I would go for sure. Yeah. I, I always chuckle a little bit because, you know, we're, we're big Denver Broncos fans, which has been a bit painful for the past uh, year and a half, but it's- They're not doing well? Well, they're doing much better, actually. Russell Wilson is really coming around and the, and the team is playing much, much better. But we go to a lot of Broncos games and we'll see an ad for Botox injections in the middle of an NFL football game. And I always wonder, that is not cheap real estate. And I really wonder what's the return on investment for that type of marketing. Um, but again, we, we love the team. We love going to the games, but- I'm not sure we'll be advertising in the middle of an NFL game anytime soon. I can't imagine what that would cost, dear. Yeah, yeah I, sure. I do know a couple of the um, surgeons have um, bought like, um, what do you call them? Um, the halftime or, you know, or what's the big, what's the big um, football game called? Oh, Super Bowl. Yeah, Super, Super Bowl. Bowl Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. Those... They buy the local ads you know and yeah. um, i can't imagine what those must go but they're probably like a cable or something but um that you have one second to get someone's attention on that and it's better be yeah. the ones i have seen have not been the most tasteful ads um oh. they're, they're definitely talking to a certain demographic um but again i really think that through before you do that there was like no call to action you, you barely have any time to put up like a website you know like a url so have you ever tried something like that we, we haven't done that. Um, we, we've looked into local advertising multiple times. And again, the, the, the cost of that type of advertising, at least in the Denver market, is, is prohibitive. And the, I, I haven't had an opportunity to look at the ROI, but I can't imagine that it would be large enough to justify that amount of an ad spend. But again, it's something we're always evaluating. And again, I think from a Branding name recognition standpoint, that would be a great way to do it, but it is just incredibly costly, and I think it's difficult to make that work. And, you know, branding, I mean, how many times have we seen an ad for, um, you know, multi-billion dollar corporations, and we still can't remember their name? Um, I just I just wouldn't put my money there. I would go way more uh, targeted and repetitive. We need that repetitiveness. Um, and I don't think the whole world needs to know you. I think, you know, people who want facial cosmetic surgery need to know you. I would just get so good at where are they, you know, because I don't think a lot of them are at the Broncos football game, quite frankly. I but, would agree with you. You know, we, we certainly have a lot of uh, patients that attend Broncos games, but sure. I think if you're going to a Broncos game, that's not where you're going to find your facial plastic surgeon. 
No, I well, I go with laser hair removal for the for the men, or not laser hair removal, yeah. um, hair transplant for the men, maybe. Anyway, um, so let's talk about your practice itself. So you're the only provider, or are there other providers? How are you set up? Yeah, so my practice, um, I am the only physician in the practice. We do have a nurse practitioner. Uh, we have had an injector of some variety for about the past five years. Um, our current injector has been with us for about six months. She is a nurse practitioner, uh, incredibly skilled, great personality, um, very competent, very focused on full facial treatments with Botox and, and dermal fillers. And she's really been a, a, a big boon to our practice. One mistake I've made in the past is bringing on an injector and essentially just giving my injectable practice away to that individual. And I, I think patients feel like their, their trust has been a little bit violated. And so what we've done in this most recent um, arrangement is to give all of our patients an opportunity to make appointments with Mariah, who's our nurse practitioner. But I've kept performing the injections for all the patients that want to um, continue coming to see me. Because I think, you know, once you build that relationship, even if you're still in the practice, if you're not available to perform those non-surgical um, or maybe laser treatments, I think patients do feel like they've, they've invested a lot in, in me and the business. And I, I think they're just, they, it leaves them with a bad taste in their mouth when we just walk away and sort of, you know, wash our hands of those treatments and just hand them off to someone else that is to some degree an unknown uh, commodity. Did you train her the way you want it done? Because I find that seems to happen a lot. Your way of doing it wouldn't be their way of doing it. I've been in practices where the um, injector was so over injecting that they were going to develop a horror, horrible reputation and okay. they had to quit that. <laughs> yeah. I, I have definitely brought on, uh, I brought on a physician assistant as my first injector and uh, she has zero experience in facial aesthetics. And so I trained her on pretty much everything, um, which, which is good and bad. I think it takes a lot of time investment. It takes a lot of time away from the practice that's, that's so lucrative for a surgeon, but um, the upside is, you, you know, you train them exactly how you want them to function, and they essentially have access to all of our trade secrets and all the information that we've developed. But in this most recent um, iteration, you know, Mariah came very well trained. She worked for a uh, plastic surgeon in my community, and so she really kind of hit the ground running. I, I worked with her a little bit on more high risk areas of injection, like the nose and the globella, but she is really just very talented, has very good judgment, is very thoughtful, and has really sort of leaned on me just for one-off cases where she's doing something that she hasn't done a lot of in the past, but really just very skilled and, and uh, ready to um, do the job when she arrived. So it's been very, very nice. Did she bring a following with her? No, not really. Um, she her her role locally here was, you know, more of a surgical assistant part time and an injector part time. And I get the sense that it was probably ninety percent non injectable treatments. Um, she does still spend some time up north in another practice that's way outside of our community, and I think she had a much more loyal following in that area. Um, but here we we've, we've really sort of built her practice organically and built her practice out of my patients that are looking for um, sooner appointments, a little lower cost for the treatments. Um, you know, I like to think they enjoyed coming to me, but, you know, now they have a, another option. And, I, and uh, again, as I said, uh, patients have been very happy. And the nice thing is the other area where she does work. Um, part time, she's about 75 to 90 minutes away. So we don't really have to worry about, you know, any competition concerns either on my side or on the other practices side where she works. So it's been a nice, you know, marriage of sorts where she can kind of go to the areas where she wants to work. And um, about half the week, we have just a, a premier injector who does just a great job uh, for our patients. 
You know what I, I would say about the patients who know you and you don't want them to feel rejected. Um, I love the idea of giving them the choice. So your your front desk would say, well, we've got availability for, you know, Mariah can see you next week. Um, Dr. Weber can see you in four weeks, you know, and then I do like the price. So availability and price, if you had like a tiered system there, then the patient gets to decide how much they must see you, you know, if they're willing to wait and pay more. I think that's the way to handle that because uh, eventually they'll probably gravitate towards Mariah or unless you like, do you like to do injectables and laser treatments? Yeah. I, I like the I like doing ablative lasers. I, I like doing injectables. I think it is an important part of the business. Um, I, I do a ton of training for Allergan. So I think just from a, a training standpoint, I do want to make sure that I've got a lot of experience with all of the newest products. And that when I'm training, I don't, I don't want that to be something that's inconsistent with what I do on a daily basis. So I think from keeping up a skill set, um, you know, having one more quiver in my in my arm or one more arrow in my quiver, it's nice to have that uh, expertise. But again, my focus is really on surgery. But I actually do a fair number of injectables because I'm I'm very fast, and so I can do, you know, twenty filler injections or thirty Botox injections in a in a day or a part day. And um, so again, we're we're very very efficient, and so I can um, in in one day I can see all those patients, and then spend the rest of the week focused on surgery, consultations, pre ops, follow ups, and uh, getting the the rest of the practice, which you know from a business standpoint is much more lucrative. Uh, we can cover all of those bases. Yeah. Um, let's talk about Allergan for a second, because there are pros and cons to being kind of like the vendor ambassador. Um, what do you get out of the Allergan relationship and what do they get out of it? Yeah. So, you know, what what I get for the most part is um, they get I'm, I'm compensated for those trainings. Um, that's actually become uh, much more generous than it was historically. And so it's it's not a small amount of money that I'm paid for trainings. I, I appreciate that. I will say doing you know doing surgery obviously is the much is the best use of my time from a reimbursement standpoint but I think there are a lot of a lot of ancillary benefits you know we get to know the reps really well we get to know the products really well we get early access to all of that portfolio before other injectors have access to it so you know before a lot of injectors in Colorado had Volux or Skinviv you know, we were already using these products. We were getting familiar with them. We were marketing them. We were getting before and after photos. <clears throat> but the trainings also exposed me to a lot of injectors in the area. So a lot of the referrals that we get are from med spas and other injectors that don't do surgery, or they may be surgeons that focus on the body. And I think it's just a great way to, you know, one, give back to the community, get to know other injectors in the area. But at the same time, we're also making these injectors better, more effective, and safer. So even in a sense, if, if I'm training my competitors, I mean, I've trained probably 100 injectors in the Denver area. So to some degree, you know, I'm training people who are, you know, eating my lunch or marketing the patients that I could be marketing to I think it's it's the right thing to do and on balance. I think those injectors who are competing for the same injectable patient, you know, they wind up making referrals, they wind up sending patients to us if they do have an issue with an injection or a question. And so it it really is a, a win, win, win arrangement all the way across the board. I think you do very well with that. You have a very nice word of mouth practice and it shows, you know, you've got um, you're you're not spending on advertising. The word of mouth works beautifully for you. So whatever you're doing, I would continue to do that. Um, regarding Allergan, um, do they, there was a question about advertising. Wait, we'll have to pull this out. Just a second. It was a good question. Allergan. Oh, okay. Um, back to Allergan. Do they have some kind of a PR department? Because a big pharma company like that, it seems to me, 
they could give you some good free PR. Um, it, 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 I'm sure they have a department for that. Has that been of any use to you or any opportunities there? I, you know, I think they're really, they're working on that at this time. And I, I've noticed a, a much larger interest this year. They are trying to get social media content from injectors and trainers and promote that on their platform. I think historically and, and rightfully so, they've really been focused on safety, proper use of the product, proper education of injectors. But I think as they've gotten their, you know, virtual and in-person training platforms really rolled out and tightened up and, and highly effective, I think now they have a bit more opportunity and a bit more focus on promoting, you know, individual injectors. But for the most part, I think the the sort of cachet, the the expertise of being a trainer for a multi-billion dollar company. I think that alone is is highly effective from you know a a reinsure a reassurance a branding a marketing standpoint I think patients have a choice and patients are very savvy and they at least want to go to an injector who's very well trained but you know if they have a choice between a even a plastic surgeon injector who's a trainer versus a plastic surgeon injector who's been injecting for 5 or 10 years in many cases, if we make it otherwise convenient, they're going to choose the trainer because we have that perceived higher level of expertise. Mm -hmm. Well, anybody who's training people, um, it's really high up on the consumer's list. I always say, make a big deal out of that. If you're training on your own innovative techniques, that's something not everyone can say. So I would definitely use it to differentiate. Um, so let's talk about your wife. I believe she was in the in the practice. Now she's out of the practice. In out, which one? <laughs> my my wife is has been everywhere in the practice, and uh, and and now she's everywhere outside the practice. Um, she she's really a a unique asset to you know me, my business, my family. Her background is in commercial construction management. Her father was not only a contractor, but an architect. Um, she can design, she can build. Uh, she did all the design for my first office. <clears throat> she did all the design for our second office. Um, she's done paint, color, furniture, fabric, um, layout, you know, um, the uh, space plan for the offices. She's been my medical assistant. She's been my patient coordinator. She's been my receptionist. She's been my office manager. Um, we started this practice in 20, we started in 2013. She had been my medical assistant for about six months. And, you know, I resigned from the practice when I decided I wasn't going to buy it. I gave my four months notice, which was what was in my contract. And uh, Camille, my wife, who was my medical assistant at the time, we had just a professional relationship at that point. Um, she was fired the next day. So again, business breakups are always difficult. But um, she was devastated because she was, uh, you know, a mother of two, and uh, you know, I was still working in my previous practice. And I, I said, you know what, you've got this unique skill set. We have to find office space. We have to design office space. We have to do all this work. And it, it's actually a blessing in disguise because you've got 40 hours a week or 60 hours a week where you can put this all together for me. I'm going to do my job. I'm going to work, you know, I'm going to work the last four months of my contract. And then when four months are up, you know, you and I will hit the ground running. And um, it, it worked out. It, it took us about six months to get into our new space, but we leased space from a, from a friend that was right next door. And so we literally would walk over and watch the contractor building the new office in between patients. And so um, I, I guess that's a long way of saying that she has a skill set that's more diverse than anyone I've ever mentioned you know, before. I met her, she was a medical assistant in a medical practice. In college, she worked for Shiseido. She's done makeup, 
shoes. I mean, everything that is important to our patients, you know, the, the way they look, the way they're put together, the way their makeup looks. I mean, she can do all of those things, but she can also build out an office and get the design and the, and the um, style and everything else just right. Um, so she's been a wonderful asset and she's actually helped design offices for um, colleagues of mine in town. And so <clears throat> she literally can do pretty much any of the work that we need in an aesthetic practice. And for quite some time, she was thinking about turning that into a consulting business full time. And uh, with, with a few family things that have happened over the past couple of years, you know, we, we had a, a, a death in the family. Camille actually lost her mother about a year ago. She just said, you know what, it, it's time to make a clean break. You know, your office is up and running. You know, we, we've done everything that we need to. She decided to actually go to culinary school. So she is in her final week of culinary school this week and um, is just crushing it. Her food is amazing. Everything is really um, just next level with her with regard to cooking and, and being a chef. And so I, I don't even know how to describe her skill set. I mean, it, it is so broad and, and wide ranging, but you know, we we have just benefited immensely as a as a business and as a family of her drive, her background, her really diverse interests and, and wide ranging skill set. So do you have are you buying a restaurant in the near future? <laughs> I, I'm trying to avoid it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and and to Camille's credit, um, she has given so much thought into cooking, restaurants, being a chef. Um, she really understands that running a restaurant is, I mean, that that's a hundred hour a week job, and it's very difficult to be successful. And I think the majority of really good chefs with a great menu and a great concept and a great team, they they don't survive. You know, they it, it's that typical three to five years that a small business makes it. And and restaurants, I mean, they I think they have it much more difficult than we do as as aesthetic surgeons. I agree. Um, yeah, I lived in San Francisco for maybe thirty years, and even if it was the greatest restaurant on the planet, it has a, a time a time on it and you just say you need to go to the next trending one you know you just couldn't win <laughs> yeah yeah i mean location cuisine the menu the the, the quote-unquote vibe of the space and the restaurant there, there are so many factors working against restaurants and then you look at financing now and mortgages and the cost of raw ingredients uh, the, the deck is really stacked against um restaurants to a tremendous degree well, hopefully she didn't get the bug and she just wants to cook for you. Yeah. yeah she She's thinking she has a really interesting concept, which is potentially doing plated meals for people in their home. So oh. if you want to do a big dinner party, if you want to do an office dinner, uh, she will literally come into your home. She will cook the meal. She'll serve it for you. She will clean and she will leave and you'll have a great meal. And for all intents and purposes, it's like she was never there. There was just a meal served with, you know, a five-star level of service. And then she's gone, everything's clean, and you move on to your to your next day. So we'll see where that takes her. But I, I'm really excited about that idea. And I think, again, if she decides that that's not working for her, that's very easy to pivot and move on to something different as opposed to shutting down a restaurant. Yeah. yeah. Um, and if she's if she's really uh, got some connections, she could be on like, uh, I don't know if those are shows are still around the housewives. Did you ever have the housewives of Denver? But if she could get on the housewives of something and then you could come in as the plastic surgeon consultant yeah. <laughs> after dinner, you could do consult and get a lot of PR out of that. I don't think that we've had a Denver um, housewives show. I mean, that is so far from what I'm comfortable doing. And, and for her as well, yeah. um, you know, she's, she's gorgeous. She's photogenic. She's well-spoken. She's all of these things. But uh, I think both of us at the end of the day, we'd much rather fly below the radar and, you know, we can do our business. We're very 
personal with people. We're very open with people. We work hard at it. But given the choice between being exposed on television or just doing our work to the best of our ability, I think we're definitely in that in that latter camp. I I don't derive any energy from you know, I'm not an extrovert. I don't derive a lot of energy from being in big crowds or, you know, being in front of a lot of strangers. And and I can make it work in the office. I mean, that's a business. But uh, given the choice, I think we'd both rather be a little bit behind the scenes. So many doctors want to be that guy on, on TV. It takes a certain personality and it's not all rosy. You know, there's a lot. Yeah. Of the, yeah. yeah. No, thank you. I've got enough problems with uh with my business just being, you know, one location, you know, seven seven to eight employees, I think that's that's enough problems for me right there on a daily basis. Let's talk about staff then. Any staff tips for hiring, firing, motivating? One good thing that you did, you actually got a manager, like a real like COO, didn't you? That's no, we 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 did. I, I've been through probably half a dozen managers in fifteen years. I think we're we're at a point right now when we're in between managers. Um, there's there's always changes. I think our needs change as the business grows. The the needs of our employees change, and so I've I've actually taken on a lot of those managerial duties over the past year. And um, I'm getting to the point where they're becoming a bit a bit too much. Um, I need to bring in someone else to manage those things, but I've actually really enjoyed getting a lot of the kinks worked out in our practice just by being more hands-on. But I would say hiring and firing that from a firing standpoint, you know, once that decision is made, I think it just needs to be done. It's like that that phrase, hire slow, you know, fire fast. I think you're not doing any employees a favor by keeping them on if they're not doing the job. It sets a bad example for other employees. It creates a toxic work environment. And I think we're hesitant to fire because we, we we genuinely like people and we want them to be successful. But the sooner you can get, you know, the person that's in the wrong seat on the bus, either into the right seat or onto a different bus, I think we're really doing them a favor and we're doing a favor to our entire team. But from a hiring standpoint, I would say. You know, do I do a lot of those interviews myself, which I never used to do, and I'm much more comfortable with the people that we've been hiring because they get to meet me, they get to spend some time with me, and I really get to know them. I'm not seeing them as the third or the fourth or the fifth interview. So in a lot of cases, I'll meet people in the office, I'll do a 15-minute interview, and they're, I just realize they're a bad fit. I'm not wasting a lot of the other employees' time. But I do make sure that every every potential employee that I think is going to be a good fit, they meet my entire team. Because if I really love somebody and I connect with them and they don't, you know, gel with one or two or three of my employees, that relationship just is never going to work for any of us. And so that's one thing I've learned. You know, I used to hire people that I would meet and the manager would meet and we would realize on day one that that new employee with an existing employee are like oil and water. It's just, you can see that plane sort of, you know, spiraling out of control on the first day and it, it, it never works out well. So I think getting everybody involved, everybody has a right of first refusal. If an employee hears something, if they detect something, I'm completely open. And I can't tell you how many candidates I've interviewed that I really liked. <clears throat> And then I found out from an employee that interviewed them that, you know, they had a trial coming up in three months for a criminal case or, yeah, or their family was moving in three months or they were starting school in three months. Um, it You just can't get enough information from a single interview. And so I actually reject a lot of potential employees based on information that my employees bring to me. They really, they do the sort of reconnaissance for me. For sure. And they're going to embrace this person a lot more if they were involved in that decision. They don't want somebody thrown at them and now they have to deal with that person and you don't, you know, so yeah. um, I highly recommend that. I also recommend having them shadow for um, at least a half a day or maybe a day 
where you're not there the whole time, the staff is working with them. That's where the staff, we women are really good at, you know, looking into the personal kind of stuff. And that's what you want to hear, you know, what's what's going on in their lives and all those questions you can't ask on an interview, um, your staff can find out. So, yeah. 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 Have they're you they're, heard, they're you're, very good. Yeah, they're very good detectives. They can find out almost anything. But yeah, I had an interesting experience. Uh, two or two, three weeks ago, we hired a new medical assistant. And she met with me. She met with my patient coordinator. She met my um, concierge, our, our receptionist. But she hadn't met our, our lead MA. So I was in surgery two-thirds of the day at the surgery center. I said, hey, come in. Meet with our lead MA, you know, if, if you have time. And I showed up, you know, six hours later from the surgery center to do one quick surgery in the office. And this candidate was still there. She basically set up her own working interview, you know, spent the entire day with my MA, observed surgery with me and my MA. And, you know, clearly she was the one that got the job offer. You know, I, I liked her enough to bring her back for a fourth, you know, interview with a fourth team member. And then she spent, you know, six hours of her day that I never asked her to spend there. And, you know, clearly is motivated and, and, and knows what we need. Very nice. Um, a lot of the practices are um, advertising on social media. You know, um, uh, we're growing, looking for a coordinator, looking for a front desk, looking for an MA. Have you ever done it that way? Or how are you going about finding new employees? Yeah, we, we've advertised everywhere. I mean, I've advertised on social media, on LinkedIn, um, Instagram, Facebook. Um, I can't say that we've ever gotten an employment lead on social media or LinkedIn that worked out. Our best hires have been word of mouth. So, you know, we, we try to treat everybody as family. So I've, I've had employees resign, move to another aesthetic business in the area, and then refer employees from that practice back to my practice. And so again, um, even treating employees that are leaving the practice like family, um, they tend to be the best sources of not only uh, future employees, but, but patients. And so again, I, I think those word of mouth referrals, people that know me, that know my team, that know the potential employee, those are the most valuable um, leads that we get, but I, I have to say indeed.com is probably our main source. You know, we we can choose a certain number of, of potential candidates just sight unseen based on their resumes. And we also tend to get a lot of resumes on a daily basis. So we might be able to review 50 potential employees in, in five days. And I found that sort of volume tends to make it easier for us to find the right candidate. Yeah. Um, so overall, what's been the biggest challenge of running a solo practice for you? It, it, you know, on this on this point, it's it's staffing. I, I think, you know, we've got a pretty good idea of who's going to show up on Monday for their first day. We don't know who's going to show up 90 days later. Um, and I think life really is life is challenging. I think we could have a great employee with the, the best skill set that's a perfect fit and they're motivated. And then, you know, they have family issues, they have they have childcare issues, they have relationship issues, or you know, things that they have a death in the family. I think it's it's hard to know, you know, what that employee is gonna look like three months from now, let let alone three years. Right. And I never expected this to be as big of a problem when I started in, in plastic surgery. I figured, you know, I'm a people person. I treat people fairly. I'm kind of an open book. I'm going to hire one team and they're going to be with me for 15 years. I mean, I, my patient coordinator, so you've met, you've met Heather. Love her. Yeah. Um, Heather's wonderful. She's been with me about six years. She started as my as a medical assistant, and she is just a rock star, unbelievable um, patient coordinator, and just a loyal member of our team. And Camille was with me, you know, 2013 full time until about 2022, and so she she's been with us about nine years. But otherwise, I mean, the vast majority of employees have been with us six months, a year, 18 months. It's really not. 
it's not nearly as easy as I expected. It's it's gotten much easier the past maybe 12 months since COVID, but it was difficult before. It was a nightmare for about that two and a half year period. And it's starting to improve. But I mean, we still have people accepting job offers that just show up for a day and then disappear. Or, you know, you offer them a job verbally, they accept it, and then they're they're just gone. You can't you can't track them down. So I think we have a great practice. I think we compensate people fairly. We, you know, we have the 401k plan, we have a match, you know, we have uh, treatment benefits, you know, we, we take the staff out for lunch, you know, we're going for manicures and pedicures on Monday night because we met one of our goals. And uh, believe it or not, I'm there getting a mani-pedi as well. So it's a lot of fun. I think we have a great team and we have a good time together. But again, we're, we're all different. Our goals are different. It's just hard to know, you know, who's going to gel with the team and who's going to be there for the long term. But I, I think we're really trying to develop a core team that's going to be there for three to five plus years. Yeah. Well, hang on to Heather. Yeah. 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 She's wonderful. And, uh, you know, Kimberly, who's our lead uh, medical assistant now, she's fantastic. But again, we're it, it's a moving target to try to figure out what we can do to really get that team in place and, and make sure that we can deal with all the unexpecteds that come up for them and uh, and and keep make them happy and keep them happy. But I have to understand, you know, a lot of it is you know, a lot of these employees, whether they're a, a medical assistant, a practice concierge, you know, they also have goals for themselves. So their long-term goal may be to go to nursing school. It may be to be internally promoted. And so we can do everything right. They can do everything right. But, you know, our long-term goals may not jive with their, their long-term goals. So we do our best, but that's probably the biggest challenge that we've had. Uh, what I recommend is to, I call it like the coffee clutch. Um, every six months uh, have not, I don't know if you should ha have coffee with them, but you know, the manager or the, or the top person there and you leave the premise, go to a Starbucks and um, there, it's a very informal discussion, but it's those kinds of questions like, how are things going? Any frustrations? Um, how are things going at home? You're trying to check in with them and find out um, like things like um, if you if you were managing this practice, you know, any ideas for growth, you're trying to figure out where their head's at. And if they are starting to waffle, um, you're just trying to catch it ahead of time if you can. Yeah. Yeah. It's that, that idea of a stay interview. You know, we're all comfortable with an exit interview. You know, the damage is done. The person's leaving. You say, hey, for the next person, what do we do? But I think Taking your, I mean, every, everybody has concerns, you know, we're never going to be perfect. So taking that employee that's currently happy, they're doing well. And as you said, Catherine, just, you know, figuring out what we can do better or what those little stumbling blocks are that we can improve. And just get them to talk, you know, communication, yeah. everything. Um, so um, the last question regarding business, is there a growth plan here? Any plan to exit? Um, where are you heading with your practice? Yeah, you know, it, it, I think the good news and the bad news is we, we've we been, you know, just wildly successful beyond my expectations. And so there is a temptation just to take your foot off the gas to some degree and just, you know, it, it's almost an annuity. It's like, let's just keep doing what we're doing. Let's keep it easy. Let's keep it simple. But I think from a business standpoint, I've started to think about this much more like a business as opposed to a medical practice. And so our, our immediate plan is, is to open a med spa. Uh, again, the, the challenge for me right now with mortgage rates being what they are and with real estate in Denver still being incredibly expensive despite what we've been through, it's, it's not the best time to buy a spot, but our one to three year plan is to buy a new location, open a med spa practice. And that would mainly be located in Denver proper or um, somewhere just outside of Denver proper, you know, exposure to other patients, uh, my ability to go down to that location and see consultations one day a week. Um, but again, just having a bit of expansion where we can have more employees with a different focus and a completely different vibe for that practice 
Um, but longer term, um, I really want to bring on a plastic surgeon that focuses on breast and body. And I don't know if that would be in my current location or this, you know, potential new location that we'd be opening. But, you know, we really don't, it, we cover facial aesthetic surgery 100%. Uh, we cover injectables and lasers 100%, but I, I refer a lot of these patients for breast and body surgery elsewhere, and it would be wonderful to keep that business in-house. And, you know, we our, our patient list is 5,000 strong, so we do have a very large um, contingent of patients that are looking for these services that we just don't provide. And so... I would love to bring on someone for that new sort of profit center in our practice. But again, I'm 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 conservative. I don't want to upset the apple cart. As I mentioned, you know, we've been more successful in 10 or 12 years than I ever would have expected in my entire career. So uh, there, there's always that sort of hesitation on my part, which is, you know, we bring on a new physician. Plastic surgeons, as we know, are demanding. We can be difficult. Um, you know, we can really upset the apple cart. But I, I think in the end, if we're going to grow, grow this business, improve our, you know, EBITDA or our net income, it has to be adding another surgeon and not someone who does exactly what I'm already doing. So I think that really comes down to a, a plastic surgeon focused on the body. Um, or potentially a dermatologist that's focused on face and body aesthetics. But I think that the low hanging fruit would be adding a body plastic surgeon. I love that idea because you're not going to be competing with him or her. They, You do neck up, they do neck down, no problem, no boundary issues, no competing. Um, I think that's terrific. I would take your time hiring that person and make sure they don't want to be the alpha, you know, um, yes. I think often happens. Um, you know, somebody who um, wants to go home for dinner, maybe somebody who wants a nice, uh, easier life. And because I, I don't think you mind managing the business, right? No, I, I actually enjoy it. And I'm, I'm really hands on. So I, I find myself getting in other people's way when there's someone managing those things, because I really want to know what that document looks like, how it reads, you know, I'm picking out grammar and spelling errors, and they drive me crazy. So I I kind of enjoy having my my fingers in all those aspects of the business. Oh, well, well, the, the word is out. If you're a plastic surgeon who wants to get home for dinner, you might want to talk to Dr. Weber. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> and we and we can share my email and and all of that information. But yeah, I would love to find somebody who really just wants to build a practice, wants to work, uh, wants to have good staff, but doesn't necessarily want to stay until 7 p.m. interviewing people. Uh, and find somebody who wants to fit into a business that's really sort of a premier practice already that doesn't offer any body um, surgical services. So yeah, I'm open to any resumes that might be sent my way. Yeah, that's terrific. Um, let's talk about marketing. Have you noticed that patient trends um, are, are changing a lot? Uh, for example, you basically do facelifts quite a bit. Are they the patients getting any younger? Uh, different? Are they asking for much different kinds of procedures than they used to? What What are you finding? I would say in, in general, our, our facial aesthetic patients are becoming younger. And younger, you know, it might be somebody who comes in at 55 for an upper eyelid surgery and a face and neck lift, as opposed to coming in at 70, and they want the blue, pa blue plate special, you know, hairline to jawline rejuvenation. But I think the most striking change has been more and more young women, I'm, I'm talking in their 20s, you know, even early 30s, coming in for deep neck surgery. So these are young women who, again, good skin, not sun damaged. They take good care of themselves. They do Botox, they do fillers. But, you know, they have structural issues with their neck where at 10 years old, they didn't have a great neckline. It, at 20, it was even fuller. And so these are patients that are coming in for structural aesthetic surgery in their 20s. And I've got to say, I love it because you can take these relatively young, um, some men, but mostly women. We can change that deep neck structure, just give them 
a beautiful jaw and neckline, and they're going to enjoy that for 20, 30, 40 years before they ever need to come back for any other aesthetic treatment. So it's it's life changing. It makes these young women look a way that they never even did in their teenage years, but they look natural. They just look sculpted or you know snatched, as a lot of people say. They look great. They have a facial structure that they never had before, and it's really life changing. And as opposed to taking somebody in their 50s or 60s who's really just trying to look the way they did 10 or 15 years ago, you know, we're creating a facial, you know, lower facial structure that they never had before, even when they thought they looked their best in their teens and 20s. It's really gratifying for, for me and for those patients. Are they finding you on social media or SEO or how are you marketing to that? Because that's those are two very different groups. The younger girl who yes. wants to, you know, get her just actually get a good structure going. And then the older woman who's just trying to buy some time, you know. Yeah, I'd say the, the most target rich environment for those younger patients is Instagram or, you know, TikTok. We really focus on Instagram. Um, but I mean, th- those photos are just really uh, they're, they're night and day differences. I think they look beautiful on Instagram. And that's where that patient population is. Um, we do see a surprising number of patients in their 50s and 60s that find us on social media. Uh, but again, I, I think most of that demographic, they're finding us through SEO or pay-per-click. Um, I've got to say pay-per-click has been the most expensive way to reach patients for us. But over the past couple of years, that's been the most effective way for us to meet new patients. So we're still using pay-per-click a bit more heavily than I would like, but we're trying to do that in concert with our SEO plan and really trying to stay on top of SEO. I Googled something like 2.5 times more expensive now than they were even just two or three years ago. Um, Yeah. Theory. Yeah, I, I I was interviewing somebody for a you know a new website design, and they described it as you know Google isn't a charity; they make multiple billions of dollars on pay per click, and so they're going to find a way to make sure that most of us need to pay to be seen. So, if your SEO isn't perfect, if your website isn't lightning fast, if it's not optimized for mobile and desktop. You know, you're going to wind up paying, and I, it it breaks my heart how much money we spend on pay per click. But again, that that's like flicking a light switch. I mean, you turn on your pay per click campaign, you put the money behind it, you make sure that you've got a vendor that does just spot on ads that are well targeted, and you're going to get patience. I mean, it just it just works. But the my metric is already always well. How many facelifts do I have to do? to pay for a month of pay-per-click or to pay for a year of pay-per-click. And essentially I'm I'm working for free to do those patients. So I look at that ROI, you know, is it is it five facelifts a year I've got to do to pay for that budget? Is it one? Is it 10? And that really gives me an idea of what we need to see in return um, to make those campaigns worthwhile. So important to know your numbers. They've never been more important than now. Um, for social media, I know it's very difficult to track that, but has that been a good marketing channel for you? And how many hours are you using it per day or per week to create content? You know, to create content, I, I spend probably a couple of hours on social media. And again, that's putting together images you know, before and afters um, per, per week. Okay. Um, well, that's not bad. Yeah. Yeah. And and so again, we're we're a bit late to the party. I think we're we we don't spend as much time as I would like to on social media. But again, it, it is a good source of patience for us. I think our engagement numbers are good. But again, I would like to grow that following. And I'm currently interviewing a potential new employee that would take that over 100%. Um, she's a young college graduate who has a background in video, marketing, documentary production. And so I really would love to just take our incredible content and our incredible practice and just give that to her as a a palette to basically create social media content for us. But 
It's been good. We spend a little bit of money on social media advertising, probably on the order of, you know, a couple of thousand dollars a year. So it's really a very small budget. But um, again, I think patients expect for there to be a social media presence. So even if it isn't a focus, there has to be good content that's updated, you know, five days a week, seven days a week. They have to see you out there in that space. Otherwise, people wonder, you know, it's like, 10 years ago, if you didn't have a website, you know, what what are you doing if you're not on the internet? I think they have the same question today. You could have a vibrant, robust practice and not need any additional patients from social media, but a certain number of patients will look for you on Instagram. And if you're not there, or if your account isn't active, they're going to wonder like, what what's going on? Why, why aren't they out there in this, you know, theater presenting information about the practice. Honestly, I think most of the time they're looking at your social before they get to your website. I think it's changed. They used to go to your website first, find you through SEO for perhaps, and then they go to check you out on social. A lot of times it's turning around now. So I think you need to be there. How are you handling the before and after photos? They're everything. We love to see photos and we don't want the eyes blocked out. How yes. any, tips, any tips for that? How are you getting photos? We we ask everyone, I ask everyone personally. Yep. Um, I ask, you know, I, I take all my photos because I want them to be perfect. I want the camera setting, the lighting, the room, you know, the lighting is the same, everything is the same. Um, I, I've lectured extensively on, on photography and it's really important to me. So when I'm there in front of the patient, I'm taking their photos, I'm telling them how gorgeous they look. And I'm saying, hey, have I ever asked you to use your photos for marketing? And I'll explain how important it is. Really, th those are my bona fides. So if I don't have photos, I'm I'm dead in the water. And uh, so I explain that to them. And I would say even with that pers personal um, touch point, we probably get 10 to 20 percent of our patients agreeing to have their photos used. Otoplasty, 90%. Um, neck lift, if I can show just the lower face, it's it's probably 50 or 60%. But eyelids, rhinoplasty, brow lifts, face lifts, if we're trying to show the full face, it's probably 10 to 15%. So I really make a point of asking everybody. Um, we don't induce anybody. We don't offer any gifts. We don't offer any kickbacks. I Personally, I feel a little bit, um, a little bit uneasy with that. You know, offering some sort of financial inducement to let someone use their photos. Um, again, I, I don't know how other people feel about that, but again, we we just explain, we ask early, we ask often. Um, similar to our process with asking for reviews, it's just you know, if somebody's happy at a month, we ask, we take their photos. And again, we just give them sort of a an honest explanation of what those photos do to us and how much they mean to us. And um, we try to get as many people as we can to oblige. But you know, I'm I'm not sure if I would be comfortable posting my full face on the internet. I you know, would. I don't care anymore. I you know yeah. the, the stigma is pretty much gone. I would say for plastic surgery. Yeah. On um, the younger kid, I mean, that what the heck was social media? All of a sudden, yeah. everyone's showing everything, everybody, everything. So, um, so I, I think that's the pro of social media is that a lot of people now are willing to. But it's a numbers game. You're just you yeah. have to keep asking, ask everybody, and and some will say yes, and some will say not all the way. Um, one surgeon said, um, "Oh, you know, I'd love to use your photos in my marketing efforts. Are you okay with that?" And they'd say no, and he'd say, "Well, can I at least get a review?" So yeah. he was, like he's always trying to get something, you know. Yeah, I think I, I listened to that. I think it was Dr. Yeah. Pro, Dr. Coleman who did that. And I actually thought, you know, that's genius. You know, yeah. typically by the time that someone is photo ready in our practice, you know, they've already told us they're happy. And, and it's it, it's when people say they're happy, whether it's a week post-op or a year or two years, we ask. You know, I, I had a patient, you know, we did a facelift for her two weeks ago. Her bandage came off post-op day two, and she wrote a review post-op day two in the evening. Like, I love my, you know, 
it doesn't matter when people are happy. I mean, that's really the opportunity for us to ask, you know, a, a heartfelt request. Like, these are our currency. Like, please leave us a review. And uh, the most, you know, the, well, I'd say the majority of people will oblige. But if you don't ask, it's going to be one in 50 people will leave a review because we're just so busy. You know, we're so distracted by our family, by our business, by everything else, that if we don't ask, it's just not going to happen. Well, waiting for them to do it is proactively is just oh. not a good strategy at all. So I, I, mean, yeah. I, would do, I have all sorts of strategies to make that happen. And timing is everything, by the way, as you said. Um, so um, last question, though. Um, give me like a crazy patient or staff story that's happened to you in your years as a solo practitioner. I, I've been thinking about that for, for quite some time. I, you know, again, we, we've had so many crazy staff and patient stories. I, I, I really don't want to throw anyone under the bus, but I, I did, oh, I did mention we're, we're hiring. We've been hiring for a couple of medical assistant positions and I interviewed somebody a, a few weeks ago, great fit, you know, wonderful young woman. Uh, my staff met her. They loved her. Um, we, we, she got through all those steps. Um, we do a background check for everybody. So um, anybody who is being offered a job, we do a background check. And I mentioned that to her and she said, well, I had a DUI when I was 18. And I thought, you know, and knock on wood, I've never had a DUI. But when we're 18, you know, we make a lot of mistakes. I'm willing to overlook a lot of things. And you know, that that can happen. You go to a holiday party, you don't realize you've had a little bit too much to drink, you're tired, you haven't eaten food. It it can happen to any of us. It's a huge deal, but I I understand. So I said, okay, great. That that really helps me because now I don't have to have to have an awkward conversation with you when your background check comes back and you've got this thing that I've got to talk to you about. So her background check comes back a couple of days later, no DUI, no DUI, but that a conviction for felony theft and then a trial coming up in three weeks for felony theft. Oh, so I'm gun. thinking, okay. Like felony theft with a gun kind of thing? This was theft from a retailer, but you know, it's thousands of dollars of theft. And so it was a different conversation. It was, okay, um, you know, I run a business where we've got a lot of expensive products. We have a lot of patients that have expensive things. We have a lot of cash coming in and out of the practice, a lot of expensive devices. Like, I just can't afford to have an employee that maybe is going to have two convictions for theft. Plus, you know, she could go to jail in a month. So, you know, that her story, well, it was a misunderstanding and it's going to be settled. Everything's going to be thrown out. And I said, well, you know, that's a great opportunity. You know, reach out to me when the case is settled. You know, give me the information from your attorney. Like, let's go forward when your open trial is taken care of. But um, I just, I, I, I was very, very surprised. And again, um, delightful young woman motivated, hardworking, but, you know, you just never know what people bring with them into the practice. And I think it's, it's hard to find good staff, but I think if, if we do have somebody with that type of history, we're, we're a little bit behind the eight ball in terms of finding somebody who's going to be a good fit for the long term. So, well, quite frankly, that woman needed to mention to you that way before that, like, are you, she, you yeah. told she was going to do a background check. She doesn't, she's not friends with the truth. I, I absolutely, yeah. she didn't know as far as I'm my, concerned. My thought would be potentially, you know, I'm going to give you this, I'm going to be vulnerable. I'm going to tell you something that you don't already know. And maybe you won't run the background check to find these other things. And, you know, we, we do it for everybody. You know, there are great services out there that cost 65 bucks. I mean, that is the best spent sixty-five dollars that that I have ever spent. Yes, an employee. So I would recommend it. I mean, I've seen all kinds of things on those background checks. We've overlooked certain things, but 
you know, there, there are certain things that are just non-starters for us and theft, you know, whether it can involve business assets or something that a patient brings in with them, it's, it's going to be very hard to make an argument to hire someone like that. But again, we all make mistakes. Delightful woman. I, I hate to say no. I like to give everyone a chance. But again, that, that was one of those where like, I, I couldn't believe what I found on, on that background check. I've had a few of those. I didn't even have to buy a background check. I just went online and Googled a little more aggressively. And um, it's crazy. Like some of this stuff is crazy. And they even have yeah. videos of getting into a fight in a parking lot with the ex-wife <laughs> and blah, 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 yeah. blah. Dear Lord, drop the drama at the door. That is yeah. my theme. Yeah, so. I, my employees always do that. I'll, I'll meet with an employee. I'll send the resume to the staff. And they're immediately on their phone. They're, they're on Instagram, they're on Facebook, they're on LinkedIn, and and they'll just text me screenshots like, you need to be careful about this, or did you see this? And it, it really shapes our conversation. And I think it gives us a much more global um, idea of what someone is really about. And, you know, times change, you know, you, you see a young employee and They've got a lot of, you know, bikini pics on Instagram. I, you know, 10 years ago, I think that probably wouldn't have, would have been a deal breaker, but these are young employees. And I think if you, if you eliminate anybody that does that appropriately, um, you're, you're going to eliminate a, a lot of good potential employees, but it's shocking to me what certain people will put on their Instagram publicly. And they're surprised when you, when you pass. On when you're surprised. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if times change, the culture changes, expectations change. And I, I think we have to change too, because that's really our pool of potential employees. Well, and they're going to be taking care of us as we retire. God, God help us all. <laughs> yes, yes, for sure. And so last question, and we're going to wrap it up. Tell us something we don't know about you. Oh, um, you know, I, I'm a bit unique among plastic surgeons that, uh, do you know Mark? Mark Beatty in Atlanta. Of course. Uh -huh. You know, he is the only other plastic surgeon that I know that has races or has raced motorcycles. I I am all about anything that goes fast, that has a motor. So dirt bikes, street bikes, snowmobiles, skiing. Um, it's every other weekend that we're up in the mountains and we are doing something in the mountains, either on the snow or the dirt. And um that that is like my therapy. That's like my meditation. But if it's got a motor, if it's fast, I'm I'm going to be on it. And uh, I I never expected that my passion would be motorcycles as opposed to expensive cars. You know, I I love nice cars. My wife drives a beautiful car, but I drive a diesel truck because that's what I use to drive my motorcycles and trailers and snowmobiles around. But I'm really a toy guy, and I, I love speed, and I love machines. That is so interesting. I did not see that in you. You just seem yeah. very quiet and conservative and kind of introverted, and then you're a madman on the weekends. That's we, fantastic. Yeah, <laughs> we, we have such a great time. And, you know, for me, when I was a kid, I, I played a lot of organized sports, but I wasn't really good at any of them. Like, I enjoyed them, but I was not going to be a basketball superstar. So, you know, my dad and I rode dirt bikes and I raced dirt bikes all over California. And that those were my formative years. And so, one, I really enjoy it. But two, you know, my kids, even our daughter, is really passionate about these things. And, you know, we live in Colorado. We've got the Rocky Mountains right here. And, you know, you can go a little bit further west. You've got the desert and you've got Moab and you've got Utah. And, we really take advantage of all those opportunities that we have in, in this area. And uh, a lot of them involve uh, machines. So nice. So um, everybody, that's going to wrap it up for us. Um, if they, Dr. Weber, if they wanted to get a hold of you, I do know your website is called WeberFPS.com for Weber Facial Plastic Surgeon or Surgery.com. Any other way they can get a hold of you? Yeah, our, our Instagram is just at Weber. FPS, that's Frank. F is in Frank, P is in Paul, S is in Sam. My email is drweber with one B, like Dr. Weber, at Weber FPS. But 
Yeah, any any questions or again, if there's if I'm lucky and there's a uh, plastic surgeon out there looking for a place to land, shoot me an email, send me a DM, but uh, I'm usually pretty easily reachable through those uh, methods. All right, that's fantastic. And that's going to do it for us today. Um, thanks so much for joining us. If you feel so compelled, please give us a review and subscribe to Beauty in the Biz. And if you've got any questions for me or want to do a strategy call, uh, you can schedule that on my website at katherinemaley.com. Or you can certainly DM me as well at Instagram at katherinemaleymba. Thanks so much, and we'll talk again soon. Take care. The fastest way to success is to model other successful surgeons who have what you want, but you can only see their results, not the path they took to get there. So you continue to jump from one thing to another, hoping to find something that will work for you too, but it rarely does. So try this shortcut instead. It's guaranteed to move you forward. I compiled my intellectual property to grow cosmetic revenues, everything I've gleaned over the years into one playbook of the most successful practices and what they do to win. Go to cosmeticpracticevault.com and let's grow your cosmetic revenues.